So a lot of us were pretty upset uh, over the recent loss of the unionization effort in Bessemer, Alabama. So uh, that's, of course, when Amazon uh, defeated the push to unionize their warehouse workers. Uh, now, we have some details into how nearly 1,800 workers at that plant were conned into voting against their best interests. So there's a mixture of different factors. One of them include time. Uh, and also, you have issues where you had Amazon that basically had so many advantages again, compared to the union when it came to organizing. So I'm going to kind of break down what happened and some of the major factors involved uh, in why the union effort had failed and what some of what needs to be done in order to make a successful one. So uh, now... So this was written by, uh, in HuffPost by David Jamison, who spoke to a lot of people uh, involved in this effort. Uh, one warehouse worker told him that near the end of the election that all the endorsements, all the political figures had came too late to make a difference because Amazon, turns out, started really, really early in their anti-unionization efforts. Uh, so now Amazon had been anticipating this they had been, you know, they, they had all the advantages. Uh, and Amazon actually uh, held anti-union meetings. They urged workers to vote as quickly as possible. Um, and so when this ended up getting national media attention, you had a lot of people that had already cast their ballots without speaking to a union organizer whatsoever. And so they already had in their minds the propaganda from Amazon, especially when they harped on dues. Uh, so now, as an example, this particular worker did not have her first in-depth conversation with any sort of union organizer until after she had been forced to sit through several anti-union meetings ran by Amazon consultants. Uh, in fact, she said, quote, you just can't escape it anywhere. Amazon just bulldozed. Jameson went on to interview about 11 warehouse workers and seven organizers and union, and union officials involved in the campaign. Uh, and so the reason, of course, this is important is because, uh, you know, we, we need to have the answer of how to fight back. And in order to figure out how to fight back, we need to look at the methods that they had used to be able to win. Uh, so now, for one, if you're going to unionize, you got to get out the message. Right now, company propaganda is incredibly effective. Not only that, but the company had so much power, so much money, which served as essentially a bullhorn. Uh, the company ended up having a, uh, a billboard on the interstate. So that is anti-union. Now, another issue that was detailed in this report is the issue of turnover. Uh, and this actually worked in Amazon's favor and against the union. So if you have a high turnover of workers... Uh, at this particular, you know, warehouse or whatever, the workers aren't necessarily going to be invested in a union push. Uh, and Amazon, at least this particular warehouse, had a turnover rate that was astronomical. It was over 100%. That's insane. Now, that doesn't mean 100% of the workforce gets replaced. What it means is that the number of workers who quit or get fired in a year ends up being greater than the average number of workers in that facility. So that is, that's insane. Uh, now, it also, again, works out in Amazon's favor if you want to crush unions because the union must constantly generate new supporters from those uh, to account for those who had been lost to the daily churn. Uh, in fact, RWDSU, the union that was supposed to uh, represent the workers in Bessemer, uh, their Mid-South Council President Randy Hadley told HuffPost the organizers assumed that they were losing about 60 signed union cards per week. You'll never deep organize a workplace that has 100% turnover, he said. You'll just chase your tail. So that's not good. Uh, another thing that, of course, worked against him was the massive amounts of money and resources that Amazon brought to the fight. Uh, they used this money to hire union avoidance consultants. Now, these people, of course, specialize in persuading workers to vote against the union and coach supervisors on how to throttle the support. Amazon brought in at least two union avoidance consulting firms, 
According to disclosures filed with the Labor Department, they spent millions of dollars on this. One firm's filing said uh, consultants would be paid $3,200 a piece per day to conduct meetings with three names listed. $3,200 a day for union busting. Imagine if they instead used that to pay their workers. Jesus. Amazon also tapped the leading management side law firm, Morgan Lewis, to handle litigation before the labor board. And Adam uh, Obernauer, one of the RWDSU's organizers, called Amazon's union avoidance approach, quote, the platinum package. That's how much money they spent on this. Whereas, of course, the union doesn't have those types of resources. And not only that, but they don't have access to employees 24 hours a day. That's also one of the big problems in union organizing. Again, you still have to be able to have the communication channels to get out your message, to get out your talking points, to counter anti-union propaganda. And still, the advantages of the company are much, much more than any union could ever achieve. Now, for an example of their reach, Amazon had messaging throughout the warehouse, including in bathrooms, which is interesting because from a lot of the reports that we found from Amazon is that workers don't necessarily have time to visit the bathrooms. You know, the whole peeing in bottles thing and uh, uh, pooping in bags, you know? Uh, so there's more. Um, one of the most effective strategies was actually called the captive audience meetings where attendance was mandatory. So you had to go. In order to keep your job, you had to go to this mandatory anti-union meeting. Uh, and of course, in those meetings, the highly paid consultants would talk about how bad the union was uh, and would, of course, say, though, well, well, what, what are we going to actually get from a union? I mean, they're going to take all this money. In fact, one worker said they were harping a lot on dues. They were saying the union's coming in, and the union is a business. That's not true. The money they make is going to be off of you. You're nine bucks a week. They're going to use that money to buy cars. But wait, what, but that's what you're doing. But you're taking the money. You're, you're taking money that's supposed to go to you for your labor. And, and, and taking that money and basically funneling it to executives so that they can buy cars. They can buy cars. They can buy yachts. They can do all that stuff. That's how capitalism works. You sell yourself. You sell your body to the capital owners. You don't own any capital. No, the workers don't own any capital, okay? And what they will do is that they, and this is how it works, they extract as much value from your labor as they can and then keep it for themselves. What a union would do is actually give you more bargaining power so that you can bargain for your labor, okay, uh, and, and allow the workers to set the value of their labor Instead of allowing the company to make the decision by themselves of how much they will are going to extract from your labor. So remember, you should be entitled to the largest share of your labor. The problem is, is that under this system, we're not. Uh, now, the issue with Bessemer as well is that they couldn't match Amazon's ability to put out uh, – to you know, put out the anti-union propaganda. They, they just couldn't counter all of it out there. And the mandatory meetings were weekly and at one point every single day for a week straight. And as a result uh, of those mandatory meetings, the propaganda and how hard the company was pushing the workers, they felt like they couldn't speak out. In fact, uh, one worker had said union support inside the warehouse was very much a quiet thing due to fear. I don't think people even talk about it, another worker said. And the lack of open conversation, of course, makes it appear to the other workers that nobody's really interested in the union. Uh, and so that has a negative effect. That is a depressive effect 
Uh, and so that doesn't help either. In reality, of course, a lot of people were in favor of unionization, uh, but it turns out they were afraid of retaliation. There was a there was a climate of fear here, uh, and the union itself made a strategic decision into keeping this on the down low because they were concerned about retaliation, which absolutely happened. Uh, now, in a postmortem on the election in the nation, longtime organizer and writer Jane McAvillary, um, I'm sorry, McAlevey, uh, pointed to a hush-hush support as a death now for the campaign. Some workers, however, did push back in captive audience meetings. Uh, three workers told Jameson they were private about their union support but felt compelled to speak out against misinformation in the group meetings. One worker said he was asked to stay behind, and he refused. Good. Because there was no reason that you would have to stay. Uh, so a misstep by the union, of course, was trying to keep it done down low, uh, it, which ended up depressing their support. But again, it, the other thing is that they were just outgunned massively. Uh, and the these, these companies understand that they have so much power, so many tools at their dis disposal to go and crush unionization efforts. In fact, Jameson cites studies that have shown that anti-union campaigns are incredibly effective and can tip election results. In fact, in a 2009 analysis of union elections, Cornell labor researcher Kate uh, Bronfenbrenner found that unions only won elections uh, about 47% of the time when employers held these captive audience meetings, compared to 73% of the time, which they didn't. The anti-union literature, videos, and emails also appear to chip away at the union win rate as well. Uh, so that's something that the NLRB uh, and, and Congress, they really need to look into. These captive audience meetings are absolutely ridiculous. You shouldn't have to force people to go to anti-union meetings. This, this should be optional. It should not be mandatory. So this just shows that there's a huge power imbalance at work. When it comes to this, and ironically, this is why they need the union in the first place, because of that power imbalance. Um, one person, longtime labor organizer Gene Bruskin, called this discrepancy between the union's influence and the company's, quote, overwhelming. And explained that what they don't understand is the company has access to the workers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That has enormous influence over their lives. They can threaten. They can give raises. They can demote. They cannot grant favors. Every worker knows that. Um, and another thing that Amazon had used for their influence is when the union effort was starting to get well known, you had company, the, the uh, uh, you know, executives uh, and supervisors that have suddenly did a bit of an attitude change. Uh, so now supervisors, for example became much more solicitous to employees' concerns. One worker said he saw a dramatic change among the monitors who enforced social distancing in the break room. Quote, they used to yell at people. As soon as it was clear we're going to vote on the union, it was all smiles. Hey, how are you? We're here to help. Please stay six feet apart. Please and thank you. He even said that they started putting out candy for their employees. We're just going to buy you off with candy ridiculous um i'm gonna bet that now that the union vote is over these same people turn back to being assholes <laughs> to workers uh, because there's nothing stopping them but this is an example of how this imbalance ends up in the workplace um only when you're able to curb some of that imbalance does a unionization effort be successful but how do you do that that's the question um before i get to that uh, there's another issue here, uh, at least when it comes to the Bessemer warehouse. It appears that compared to other places in the region, the Amazon uh, warehouse actually paid more. Uh, wages at the Bessemer warehouse start at fifteen thirty an hour. Now remember, this is partly thanks to Bernie Sanders, who won a concession uh, from Amazon getting them to raise their wages to 15 bucks an hour. So thanks to Bernie Sanders... Um, but still, the union's stronger supporters do believe the warehouse um, uh, the warehouse needs to pay more, and I agree with that. 
Uh, and while Amazon pay actually is below that of other blue collar jobs in the area, it's actually a lot better than places like Walmart and McDonald's. Uh, so if you're coming in from fast food to an Amazon warehouse, you're going from seven twenty five an hour to 1530. Then you're going to be like, why would I need a union? I'm getting paid amazingly. Hey, I'm not saying that's right, but I'm saying that that's the mindset of some of these people. One worker said this, Amazon does pay better than other people. If you weren't working there, you might be working at Walmart for 11 bucks an hour. And so understand that this is how low wages, uh, you know, end up hurting unionization. Uh, and so this is that race to the bottom. And even in a place that is as evil as Amazon, as terrible as Amazon, who doesn't pay their people the way that they should, um, because honestly, people should be making about $23 an hour if uh, you know wages had kept up with inflation and productivity. Nonetheless, especially since we're more productive than we've ever been as a society. Um, but nonetheless, these depressed wages from these other companies that aren't necessarily competitors still depress the wages in the area so much that with Amazon paying barely a living wage, that looks pretty good to people. So that's a big problem, okay? Uh, now, if other companies were forced to pay that wage, for example, had we had a $15 minimum wage in the last COVID bill, um, then these companies, then Amazon, would be either forced to raise, uh, raise its wage or they end up getting a union in which, of course, they would end up raising the wages uh, in, in contract uh, with that union. So those are the tactics uh, that Amazon used that were very successful. And, of course, there are also allegations of dirty tricks. For example, uh, Amazon might have broken the law by having a mailbox and warehouse property when the election began. You don't do that. Uh, the Labor Board rejected Amazon's request for ballot drop boxes on site, but and Amazon decided to use the post office to place a mailbox on its campus according to emails the union obtained and the Washington Post had published. So you're, you're not able to do that. Uh, but the post office went along with it. Not good. Uh, other possible illegal tactics included Amazon hiring private detectives that were known for union busting. These detectives would spy on their workers in private Facebook groups, tracking unionization risk with heat map tools in efforts to thwart organizing efforts before they gained momentum. Amazon also illegally fired multiple employees last year who organized demonstrations to shed light on what the employees said were unsafe and bad working conditions. So... What can be done? Well, for one, we need labor laws in this country. I mean, we really, really do. Uh, we're in desperate need of uh, these labor laws. In fact, according to Business Insider, under current U.S. labor law, companies have lots of tools at their disposal to try and prevent employees from unionization, from forcing them to listen to anti-union messaging in these captive audience meetings, uh, which Amazon used, to having significant say over which employees are eligible to unionize in the first place. So if you only allow a certain subsection uh, of your workforce to be able to unionize, you're not going to get that worker solidarity. Um, even when companies violate these laws, by the way, the NLRB, which oversees union elections, lacks power to do anything to, punish, uh, to, to issue fines. So there's no incentive for companies to not break the law. If you have no laws, or if you can't enforce the laws, then the companies are going to break the laws. They they don't care. They really don't care. So, now one way to help is is to for have Congress pass the Pro Act. Um, that's a good piece of legislation. Without that, companies will still have these massive advantages, uh, but not ones that, of course, can't be beaten without more time or organization. And so this, I guess this is the main thing to push back against this. Start your, start your organization early, right? Get people involved. I wish bigger names had, had Bernie Sanders actually gotten into this union fight before, uh, earlier, 
um, had Joe Biden actually put out positive statements about the unionization effort earlier, before the voting had begun, maybe that would have made a difference. So we got to really jump on this fast because, again, that anti-union propaganda, they are there. They've got access to the workers 24-7. Organization has to start uh, quickly, and it has to start in a big way, and it has to get that national attention, and it has to get it fast. Um, aside from that, I mean, not giving up. I, I, that's the biggest part is to continue to try to organize. Even if you have a defeat, you organize. You have to organize. Uh, because, and, and and interestingly enough, this report does help labor. Because now we see what they can do. Now we know the kind of tactics to expect from these companies. And we can formulate plans on how to counter those tactics. And see what, you know, where this union went wrong. Uh, in their organizational attempt, uh, and where we can correct. And so that's important. Uh, but there is a negative effect to this loss as well. And that's knowing how many tools the companies have, and that workers right now, as a result of Congress, still don't have really anyone to back them up. Not yet. Uh, and that creates an really an air of hopelessness. Uh, in fact, one union worker, I'm sorry, one worker who supported the union but expected a loss, she actually now finds Amazon more intimidating than she did six months ago. She said, quote, they've learned how to crush a real unionization effort. So, look, I know it's easy to say for me, um, but this has to keep making people fight harder. Just because the companies have these tactics does not mean unionization cannot win. But I think right now the most important thing to do is to start to get out the information to people. Okay? People need to know what a union actually is, what they do. And that, of course, goes a long way to counter that, you know, anti-union propaganda that comes from these companies. You cannot give up, though, and you have to continue to spread that message, and you have to reach people, working class people, to combat the lies. So I'm, I'm hoping that the high-profile nature of this fight that has just happened, and Amazon basically showing their hand, uh, will start efforts to unionize in other places. Unions are starting to gain popularity again because people are starting to understand that these companies are absolutely out of control. So we've got to continue to fight. Um, people have to continue to organize to try to, you know, do what they can, uh, no matter what kind of dirty tactics that they use. We cannot give up the fight. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a like and share with your friends. You can subscribe and help out the channel by becoming a patron. It's patreon.com slash Jeff Waldorf, or you can become a channel member as well by hitting the join button below.